Now, our speaker tonight, who is, uh, uh, was born in Lebanon, I informed her that in the 50s, to remember the, those antediluvian times, there was a very famous entertainer named Danny Thomas. And people associated him with his Lebanese background. And for, for a lot of people, it was their first awareness of some personality who at least had roots, was not born here, but had roots in the, uh, in the Middle East and in the Arab world. But so much for that. Our speaker uh, uh, tonight is uh, actually a, uh, uh, interesting, she has an interesting academic background. Raya El Zain, Zain is a um, postdoctoral fellow at, of the Center uh, for Advanced uh, research uh, on in the global communications at the Annenberg uh, School. Now, her background is not the traditional kind of background we have. You know, people who are involved in this area tend to be people who have specialized in, in politics or specialized in uh, area studies or whatever. And her background actually started off in drama. Uh, she received her BA in drama from Kenyon College, one of the leading liberal arts colleges both in Ohio and in America, an MA in performance studies from the Tisch School at the, uh, of Arts at New York University, and she was awarded a PhD in theater and performance from the Graduate Center, City University of New York. She is currently working on a book, the title of which is very interesting, Filling the Head, The Politics of Listening to Experimental Arabic Rap. First of all, who knows about Arabic rap? That in itself is interesting. She's published a number of scholarly articles, including Developing a Palestinian Resistance Economy Through Agricultural Labor, uh, another with an intriguing title, From Hip-Hop Revolutionaries to Terrorist Thugs, uh, Blackwashing Between the Arab Spring and the War on Terror. Now, that topic should be the subject of uh, talk in itself, but uh, in any case, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Rhea Elzain of uh, uh, the Kevin County College. Please welcome her. Thank you. Thank you very much for that very generous introduction, Jack. Um, I'm really excited to be with you all here today. Um, thank you for coming and spending part of your um, Thursday evening here. Let me just get set up. Can you all hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, super. So um, Jack was right. <laughs> my background is, um, my training is not in communications. My training is in theater and performance. Um, and the book that I'm writing is about um, the kind of the interplay between the social media use around the distribution of music and the live concert itself. Um, so that's some of my background. Um, but today what I thought to share with you, um, they asked me to talk about social media in the Arab world. And so what I'm doing is um, sharing some thoughts based not on my academic work, based on following the news, based on um, political activism, based on my interests in the Arab world since the Arab Spring, basically, and trying to understand the uprisings and what this means for a generation of uh, Arabs growing up um, in uh, the aftermath of the revolutions. So, but since I told you my background, I'm gonna start with a little bit of that. So we can just hear a little rap in Arabic. <laughs> so this is actually a fan video that was circulated two days ago. So very recent, right? Not the official music video, but a fan video. Okay, do we have any Arabic speakers in the house? Okay, so that refrain, rekiz, 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 right? That's the word here, means focus, right? So we're gonna focus. <laughs> um, and what I've been asked to focus on, as I told you, is social media in the Arab world. So, what is social media in the Arab world? Um, my guess is that for many of us, the first thing that comes to mind is something like this, right? Social media in the, in the Arab world is a tool to combat um, oppressive regimes. 
Or if that's not what came to mind, maybe something like this came to mind, right? Where um, social media access or internet access is how we can discern how repressive or oppressive a certain state is. Um, so this gives us, I think, something like this, right? Where <clears throat> either social media is a tool for upending regional governments, um, or uh, regional governments are exercising extreme authority um, by blocking the populace's access to social media. <clears throat> and the, the top picture is the Turkish president, right, Erdogan, chopping off the head of the Twitter bird. Um, obviously, Turkey is not the Arab world, but the image kind of gives you the idea of what we're working with. Um, and in the bottom picture, we have a kind of a storm of tweets chasing um, the Supreme Council of Armed Forces or the military that backs up Sisi's regime in Egypt. Um, so this is my uh, like basic premise. That's, this is maybe the ideas associated around social media. Did anybody have ideas like this? That maybe that's what was going on? OK. All right. Um, is there feedback? Are you guys hearing? It's static. Do it. Let's see. I mean, do we need it? I have a pretty loud voice. This one? Hello? All right. Can we hear me? Okay. All right. So, um, I work, as I told you, on media and popular culture. So when I hear social media and the Arab world, the first thing I think of is how this music video got into my Okay, so basically, the premise behind this talk is very simple, okay? If the question is, how do people in the Arab world use social media, right? My answer is, well, pretty much like everybody else, <laughs> right? Um, uh, internet penetration in the Arab world, this is what we're talking about, these are the countries that we're talking about, uh, is around 65% uh, as a general average, but there is a considerable range. So the Gulf country of Bahrain leads the way with 98%, and Yemen brings up the rear with about 24% uh, internet penetration. But those who use it, use it like the rest of us do, right? So to keep in touch with family and friends, to make and share creative content, including political critique, to share news and ideas. And at the same time, governments and corporations can use social media to track uh, audiences. OK, that's pretty easy. But all of you came out to spend some of this evening with me. So let's see if we can ask a different question. And maybe the question is not how do people use social media in the Arab world, but how should we understand social media in the Arab world? And that is a bigger question. And in answering it, we might ask more questions. We might ask, why has there been so much excitement about social media in this region? Um, and what does that excitement do? What does it privilege? And what does it make it harder to see? If we're worried, uh, or if we're excited about change in the Arab world, what does the focus on social media do to that conversation? If we're worried about oppression in the Arab world, what does the focus on digital access and literacy do then? And where I'm going in this talk is to maybe suggest um, how else to think about the Arab world and social media in it besides this kind of binary between uh, change and oppression. Okay, everybody with me so far? All right, good. Okay, so the first question, why so much excitement about uh, social media and what does this excitement do? 
So you might be asking, well, what's wrong with linking social media in the Arab world to protests or to oppression? Haven't we seen a lot of that lately? Um, basically, I'm concerned with what this does. <clears throat> the question is, what ideas are attached both to users and to regimes when we're talking about social media? Um, what do we uh, imagine? Uh, when we imagine social media as a tool of protest, what kind of protest? are we imagining? What kind of protester comes to mind? Um, basically, I'm, I'm concerned that we might be depoliticizing both protesters, protesters and the regimes they're protesting against, right? So when we imagine social media as a tool of protest, I think we often imagine an educated, middle-class, uh, individual protester, right, in a non-violent protest setting. Um, and this uh, works, this actually, occludes a lot, right? It leaves out um, people who don't have access to the internet, who don't have a smartphone, right? Um, it leaves out histories of labor organizing. Um, and it, it very much ignores violence in protest, right? When we're talking about t tweeting and Facebook as protest. Um, so it depoliticizes the protester, I think. But it also depoliticizes the regime, right? When we think about a regime that is a draconian regime that cracks down on protesters, in the Arab world, what we're often doing is conjuring an orientalized uh, idea of a despot, right? Or a kind of very specific um, uh, figure, individual figure that is abstracted from histories uh, of international relations, how the US is involved in propping up those dictators, um, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm concerned with these uh, kinds of depoliticization that happen when we talk about social media as a tool of protest. So let's see how this works in a specific context. So the most spectacular of the protests of the past uh, decade was probably the Egyptian revolution, right? And the Egyptian revolution in 2011, uh, uh, crowds kind of took to the streets of the capital and other cities starting in January, uh, January 25, 2011, and by February, uh, February 11th of that year, the president, Egyptian president, Hosni Mubarak had stepped down, right? We remember this, maybe. Um, one of the primary ways that the English language media understood the revolution in Egypt and the preceding one in Tunisia was to call it a social media revolution, right? Beginning on Facebook, uh, sparking on Twitter, and in Egypt, this was reflected in the fact that a marketing executive, <coughs> this is Wa'il Ghanayim, right, had started a Facebook page that was instrumental in distributing uh, photographs of uh, Khalid Saeed, right, an Egyptian who was uh, detained by the Egyptian police, tortured, and killed in the lead up to the revolution, right? Okay. All right. What uh, what does it what does it do to call the Egyptian revolution a Facebook revolution, right? And I'm arguing that it leaves out a bunch. Okay. Um, so if we understand the if we understand the Egyptian revolution as a Facebook revolution, um, uh, kind of like an instantaneous spurring of people into the streets because of action on social media. What have we forgotten? What, we have, what have we left out? And so what I want to do now is kind of back up a little bit to see if we can fill in the pieces, and then we'll see how that stands up next to the Facebook revolution narrative. Can you guys see that? This is a little bit, it's a little bit smaller text, but okay. So the revolution is in 2011. We're going to go back to the beginning, to, to the beginning of the, the 2000s, right? So in 2000. Uh, <clears throat> nearby in Palestine, the second intifada or the second uprising had just started. So in 2000 in Egypt, right, the popular committee to support the Palestinian intifada ha had formed, right? And it was a coalition uh, of different sorts of people with different sorts of politics who came together around the topic of solidarity with Palestinians, right, to protest the Egyptian government's policies with Israel, okay? And these are the first um, kind of uh, political organizing and um, 
uh, engagements with the state for a certain generation of Egyptian activists. Following this, in 2003, we see the US invasion of Iraq, right? And in Egypt, like in the rest of the world, mobilizations against the invasion of Iraq were a crucial turning point for a generation of activists, right? These are, the, for some people, the first political experiences, um, and also, again, the first experiences engaging with the state, with the police, on a sustained level. In 2004, we see the first coalition based around local issues in Egypt, right? So you have uh, leftists, Islamists, um, and everything kind of in between uh, coming into Kifaya, which means enough, right? The Kifaya coalition, right? Uh, and in all three of these cases, we saw occupations in Tahrir Square uh, and in other cities where activists, again, engaged with the police in direct action um, <clears throat> and other forms of mobilization. So we're building kind of a repertoire for a generation of activists here. 2005, you have a more kind of start to break in the government, right? So the judiciary is, is pushing back against uh, Mubarak's uh, rule. I can skip over that one. All right, and 2006 is a big, is a big one. In Mahalla, which is a city <clears throat> in the northeast, uh, which is a, a city that is a, it's a working class city um, where the industry is textiles. And in 2006, uh, spinners and weavers organized and succeeded in building a strike that got their demands. They won their own demands, right? So this is, again, for this generation, a first big win, right? Uh, in terms of uh, political experience and organizing. In 2007, these labor strikes spread to the civil servants and government workers um, with other kinds of strikes in other cities in Egypt. <coughs> April 6, uh, 2008, um, see how we're, we're approaching 2011, right? Uh, is, uh, April 6 was another scheduled strike that was severely cracked down on by the police, right? So uh, you have a big kind of rallying cry around the defeat this time. And through 2010, you have continuing to have strikes about water access, flour and bread access, and gasoline. Um, so this, we see the labor and the civil servants strikes and organizing spread into the people, right, the general populace. Okay, so it's in this context, right, in the summer of 2010, that the murder of Khalid Saeed is like uh, able to be received by a populace that has significant political experience, right? And a, an established kind of rapport of what the police is and police brutality, okay? So it's in that context, right, that this man's murder can be such a catalyst for the Egyptian population. In December 2010, in neighboring Tunisia, right, we have the revolution there, which also acts as like a big affective push. And then January 25th is the day of revolt. February 11th, Mubarak steps down. Okay, so when we have all of this background, when we see the importance of uh, expressions of resistance to imperial projects, right, the US presence in the region vis-a-vis -vis Iraq and also via its proxy Israel, when you have an established uh, history of labor organizing, when you have an established history of uh, <clears throat> dealing with the police and police brutality, right? Can we see how this is a much more like dynamic like uh, progression of political change than Facebook revolution, right? Um, okay, so what happens when Significant critiques of empire and important histories of organized labor are sidelined in order to conceive of political change as facilitated or driven by Western technology. And I think as you kind of can hear from me, I think we get facile understandings of the region, of social media as a tool for change, and maybe most importantly, we get facile understandings of how political change happens, right? So for me, that's why it's kind of dangerous to think about Facebook, uh, Twitter, and other forms of social media, right, as the drivers of political change, or the reasons of political change. Okay, so that was, um, let's see where I am. So I was gonna show you another example. Another example um, 
of a different country. So we're going to leave Egypt and go to the kingdom of Saudi Arabia, um, which has been much on our minds lately. Campaigns around um, Saudi women's right to drive have caught Western attention for years. Um, part of this is because of the spectacular notion that women shouldn't drive, yes. Uh, and part of it um, uh, is based on some of the media campaigns that women have used to uh, camp petition for the right to drive. These two are um, activist videos of women in 2008 and 2011 they taped themselves driving first on so-called private roads, second on kind of more public uh, public roads in the kingdom. Uh, and what I want to what I want to problematize here is the relationship between protests circulated online and the increasingly dubious uh, implementations of reform in the kingdom today. Because here, as in Egypt, right, the political gains that we're seeing are not very clear. To give you a sense of what these look like. Um, and again, like in the previous example, I want to situate these two kind of uh, viral examples within a history of organizing around this issue in the kingdom. Oh, wait, what I was going to tell you here is how the recent reforms by the Crown Prince Hamad bin Salman have been framed in the Western media as a revolution. Which is its own kind of problematic thing, right? Okay. Okay, so since the 70s, 1970s, in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, before the internet, before the meme, before Facebook, right? There has been an established underground tradition of salons within the kingdom, wherein people kind of meet in each other's homes, uh, read and discuss things together in a very not public way, right? Um, uh, but in an embodied way, in a way that builds networks and political capacities. Okay, so that's been happening for a while. In 1990 was the first kind of uh, protest, organized protest, uh, for women to drive, in which 47 women drove in the streets of Riyadh at the same time, right? Kind of a, a first mass action. <laughs> um, and it wasn't, I mean, we didn't have social media at that time, uh, but that was the first kind of first one. All right. Uh, the ones I showed you, the first one was in 2008. Right, and then the second one was in 2011. So we saw those two media uh, examples uh, in between here. In 2014, um, the regime uh, framed pretty much all acts of dissent as crimes of terrorism, right? Produced a new law that allowed uh, uh, dissent and critique to be framed as terrorism. And we should note that the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia doesn't have a constitution, right? It has a kind of like a collection of fatwas or religious decrees. In 2014, we also saw a hashtag, uh, an online kind of, uh, an online campaign, if you want, that was driven in response to the crimes of terrorism bill or uh, uh, law uh, in which activists were organizing almost completely anonymously online um, be because of the harshness of the previous order. In 2017, we saw the implementation of pre-trial detentions. So the regime uh, set a system up basically where you could be detained before your trial for up to a year, for up to 12 months. Uh, but this period could, is renewable, right? So they could uh, essentially hold you indefinitely. Okay. In 2017, when they announced that the uh, ban uh, on women driving would be lifted, the regime also imposed on a set of female activists a gag order, saying that they should not or would not be allowed to talk about the removal of the ban, okay, even in a celebratory or uh, positive way. 
And this had the, the effect politically, right, of making the reforms look like they came from the top, right? They came from the benevolence of the leader, of the king and the crown prince, and not from histories of revolt and protest from below, right? It's a very important kind of, um, if we, uh, relationship with the, with the videos I showed you before. And then in 2018, we've seen in just the past few weeks the disappearance of the uh, Washington Post journalist Jamal Khashoggi in the uh, Saudi embassy in Istanbul. Okay. So what does this uh, show us? What I've been trying to do here is problematize, again, the relationship between a viral media campaign and the political effects. Right? So if we only see that um, we've seen a lot more agitation around women's driving and around the use and um, kind of pushing of this narrative in social media, uh, then we can assume, uh, or we, we, it's possible to assume, right, that this is the reason for change, right? There was this campaign, it was successful, the crown prince kind of removed the order, right? But if we look more closely, we really see that there's like a much more complicated um, history of uh, agitation, first of all, but also of the regime kind of using um, uh, using uh, changes to their own benefit, right, and to, to repress things further. And especially, I think, in the kingdom and with what we've seen over the past few weeks, we should be extremely um, hesitant about um, triumphalist narratives of revolution or reform in the kingdom. Okay. So how else might we think about social media or politics beyond these, this desire for change or the forces of, of repression? Um, how do media practices, for example, reflect widespread moods and practices and uh, behaviors? And what uh, can they help us learn about how politics are conceived? And what I'm gonna do for the next kind of two media examples is show you two other kinds of media that's been circulated virally um, and kind of read them uh, for, for in response to these questions, like how, what else can they tell us, right, without expecting them to bring about revolution or to signal oppression. Okay, the first one. Ramadan. Sayyidir Rais, Ramadan and Kareem, Wanta Mata. Okay, I should just give you a little bit more background before watching. So, um, yeah. Um, so during Ramadan, Zan and other telecommunications companies put out these ads that are kind of like moral propaganda, like it's. Um, it's an ad, right? So it's to make the company look good, but it's kind of like this uplifting moral message, I guess. Um, and they've done them on a series of topics. This year, um, uh, during the holy month of Ramadan, right, where there's a lot more TV watching uh, within the family circle. So this is this year's, um, and let's just watch it, because it is rich. We are the 
سنفطر في القدس عاصمة فلسطين يكتبها رب الأمنيات العالقة بينها ليت سنفطر في القدس عاصمة فلسطين يكتبها رب الأمنيات العالقة بينها ليت سنفطر في القدس عاصمة فلسطين Okay, so, I mean, the video obviously embodies a very distinct and pronounced affect of loss, right? Um, the voice, the main voice is a child's voice, right? Kind of embodying this powerlessness, victim, uh, victim identification, right? Um, we see the main issues, right, that, are, are, that this company sees as important, right? So we have Palestine, we have the refugee crisis, we see also uh, the plight of Muslims worldwide, right? Um, so I think it reflects a kind of general, uh, general zeitgeist of where power lies, right? Um, and it's clearly imagined to lie in international leaders, right? The song is addressed like Mr. President, um, and not, uh, not only Arab, um, not only Western leaders, but not Arab leaders, right? So the address is a kind of like, you know, help uh, help us, you know, um, address to to these sources of power. Um, we'll notice that it distinctly does not address local movements, right? Local political gains um, or activist efforts, right? And I think it's really important the figure of the of the child, right? So this opens up a lot of many cans of worms, right? But it also points to uh, the riches that like looking at a, a viral media thing can, can offer to political analysis in the region. I mean, we might ask, you know, we can understand why this feeling of loss, right, um, from all the trauma that's kind of being lived in the region, um, but why is it being embodied in this victim sense of vic victim? Victimness, victim, victimizing, victimization, yeah. Um, and how do we address that problem, right, of kind of, uh, uh, of this sense of victimization? Um, uh, what else was I gonna ask you? Those are the main questions, I think. Um, I don't have answers to that, obviously, right? I think it's just kind of like a, it puts a finger on something um, that gives us things to think about. So that's one example. I was gonna give you another example from a more kind of activist framework. Uh, this is out of the UAE, right, but kind of distributed across the region. And the second example I'm gonna give you is from Lebanon. Um, uh, around the, around um, migrant workers in the kafala system. So the kafala system in Lebanon is a way of sponsoring migrant workers <laughs> that does not give the worker many rights himself or herself. Uh, kafala means sponsor, right? So when you, and it's mostly, uh, it, it affects a lot of different sectors, but the example that I'm gonna give you here is about, is about m migrant um, domestic workers, uh, migrant domestic workers. And the problem here is that when a worker comes from the Far East or from Africa, to Lebanon on the kafala program, she often does not have uh, a way to petition for her rights if her wages are being withheld, if she's being abused, if she wants to go home, et cetera, since the rights of the worker are distributed through the sponsor, not directly to the worker. And over the past 10 years in Lebanon, there's been um, a lot of agitation around migrant labor issues in order to improve awareness among the Lebanese population about this problem um, and about uh, 
workers' rights. So this example, this video that I'm about to show you is an activist video designed to drum up awareness about the violations of the kafala system. I think that's what I'm going to show you. Oh, it's not in here. Okay, well, I'm not going to show it to you. What it looks like is a young couple, an obviously middle class couple. Um, the husband is kind of sitting on the bed in their room, and he's holding uh, the, the passport of the worker, and he's putting it in their drawer in their bedroom, right? But he's hesitating, and he's saying to his wife, who's also there, he's saying, so have we decided we're going to keep the passport with us? And she says, yes, sweetheart, that's what everybody is telling me. That's what we're supposed to do so she doesn't run away. And then the screen goes to black, and the, the tagline of the campaign is think about it, think about her, right? And it, it shows kind of like a description or an explanation of the law, right? It's illegal to withhold the worker's passport. Um, and it, it's her right to leave when she wants to, et cetera. So that was the video I was going to show you. Um, uh, <clears throat> and, and why was I going to show you this video, right? So it went viral, this one, and there were several of them that all address issues of migrant workers' rights. <clears throat> But they all feature the same kind of narrative structure, where the, where the worker is not visible, uh, and the couple are debating between each other about if, whether or not this is the right thing to do. Should I withhold the passport? Should I lock the door when I leave? Um, because migrant workers in Lebanon live with the family at home, um, and so on and so forth, right? So what I was trying to uh, draw out in this is what I wanted us to pay attention to was how this activist campaign, this awareness campaign, right, that's gone viral on Lebanese social media, figures uh, how it imagines political power, right, and how it imagines the Lebanese citizen, right? It is this kind of like conscientious, anxious, wanting to do the right thing, uh, middle class couple, right, that is envisioned and embodied as the agent of political change, right? And we can imagine lots of different ways an activist campaign might address the problem of migrant labor in Lebanon, right? But there's a specific decision to build and to kind of frame um, a middle class subject as the mobilizer there. What does that tell us, right? It's another example, I think, of how if we look at a viral, uh, a piece of uh, viral media um, <clears throat> that's being shared and distributed, to read it for how it reflects what the zeitgeist might be, right? How the population is thinking about politics, how it's imagining power, and how it's imagining agency, right? Where is that agency? Is it with foreign leaders? Is it with the middle class? And so on and so forth. We could do this with a bunch, with a variety of other examples as well. <clears throat> so the readings of these last two pieces of media, right, the Zayn ad and the uh, this activist video is sought to reflect political moods and to, to read how, how people are imagining political players. So I think media can be read as a political tool, but should be read for what's, um, what a specific text can tell us about uh, political or social moments, as opposed to uh, assuming that the media is responsible for um, political effects or political change. I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much for your attention. Appreciate it.